attitude. We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order. Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and I'm joined by my co-host, Conrad. Hello. And in this episode, uh, we're delighted to be joined by the Deputy Chief Executive of Renewables UK, uh, the uh, former Labour MP for Great Grimsby from 2015 uh, to 2019, uh, Shadow Deputy Leader of the House from 2015 to 2016, and Shadow Minister for Housing from 2017 to 2019, Melanie On, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, obviously, um, you said this yourself, you um, thought that uh, perhaps you might not um, succeed in being re-elected last year. Um, what sort of emotions were going through your mind on the night of the count? Because I imagine it must have been a bit of a surreal experience. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was a very difficult evening. Um, I mean, you don't stop knocking on doors, um, even if you think that you're not going to win. You know, I think about candidates who are in seats that perhaps have never been uh, won by an opposing party. Um, And, you know, they work just as hard. And uh, so we we didn't stop. Um, uh, It was always with a a little bit uh, of a voice in the back of my head, just thinking maybe, maybe if we just get this household to get down to the polling booth, it could make all the difference. Perhaps my gut feeling that we're going to lose by um, a significant number is completely wrong. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know what's going on in people's minds. Perhaps when they get to the polling booth, they're all sticking with their uh, their traditional uh, voting choices. Um, so, you know, you always have that element of hope. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very difficult. Um, and, you know, you get home, the, the whole um, of the election campaign was pretty wet and pretty cold and done in the dark. <laughs> and it, was, uh, it wasn't the most inspiring period of time to be, uh, to, you know, to be trying to get people to go and vote. Um, so it felt like a, an exceptionally long day, longer than usual. Um, and then of course, you know, preparing to go to the count when you, um, so you jump out of the car at, uh, I left the committee room probably about quarter to 10. Um, and, uh, we'd been phoning actually, uh, for the last 45 minutes, I'd been phoning rather than, um, knocking on doors, um, to try and turn the last few people out and, um, yeah, got in the car, got home, turn on the TV see the exit poll and just think, oh my God. Um, and that was really, that was really devastating. That was, that was a punch to the gut, just seeing how um, the predictions had, uh, had come out on those exit polls, because that was a really, that was a, a point of devastation for the Labour Party then. So um, your seat, um, Great Grimsley, hadn't had a Conservative MP since before the war. Um, mm. What do you think led seats like um, Grimsby to sort of switch the Conservatives in 2019? What do you think were the key factors? Well, I'm probably not going to tell you anything new that I haven't said elsewhere. I mean, there were, there were two driving issues. One was Brexit, which was a, a long-running sore for lots of people. We had over 70% of people in uh, this area in the referendum who voted to leave, and they felt really passionate about that they really wanted to not only passionate about leaving the EU but seeing politicians that I would have said they probably felt skeptical about and a bit detached from um, anyway doing what they have asked us to do Um, and then there was a real issue of trust in the Labour Party um, and issues around the leadership of the Labour Party because in a general election um, what the general public who are not spending all of their time you know, looking at the ins and outs of, uh, of, of political policy um, to the nth degree. Um, what they are looking at is uh, what they're seeing on the news, what they're reading in the newspapers and what they're hearing on the radio. And now what they're seeing on social media as well. Um, and that t- tends to come from the leadership. Um, and they were judging who they um, wanted and who they trusted to be the prime minister. 
and it, it wasn't the leader of the Labour Party at the time. Do you think that um, part of the reason that there was this um, swing uh, from Labour to the Conservatives um, was not just the state of the leadership of the um, parties, but also the way that um, the House of Commons was perceived um, to be uh, blocking Brexit or in, in some way stalling the result of the referendum. Do you think that that contributed to the result? Yes, and it's something that we heard a lot of. Um, and it was more than the House of Commons blocking Brexit. It was Labour blocking, blocking Brexit. It was, uh, it was entirely our fault. You know, the shenanigans in Parliament, um, you know, were, were viewed very dimly. Um, by people here, um, they felt that it was um, it wasn't about getting the right process. It wasn't about getting clarity. It wasn't about securing um, a good deal. It was just about trying to circumvent the result and try and navigate an alternate way out of Brexit. Um, and that made them really frustrated and really, you know, they. I hesitate to say angry, but I, I think that there was anger. Um, you know, they they put their trust in the Labour Party for so many years, and then here was a big issue where we'd asked them their opinion, and it seemed to them that we were just doing everything that we could to ignore it. I think that the shifts of scene in seats like Grimsby could, um, are sort of a permanent shift, or do you think that, that, that sort of Labour can win places like Grimsby back in the next election? I've been thinking about this incredibly hard, as you might imagine. Um, and I think that, of course, yes, it is uh, a seat that um, the Labour Party shouldn't forget, shouldn't neglect, and absolutely has got a fair run at winning again. Um, but I do think that it's got some pretty big hurdles to overcome. Um, and I also think that there needs to be some consideration given to um, perhaps demographic shift, um, it may well be that December 2019 was an anomaly. It was a Brexit election and people will come flooding back. I don't think the Labour Party should rest on that assumption. Um, you know, I think the Conservatives having um, Boris Johnson as their leader um, almost overcame uh, that kind of um, party political divide. He was seen to transcend that. Um, so I think it will depend on who the leader of the Conservative Party is as well. Um, obviously, uh, recently we've had a, a change in the leadership of the Labour Party. What was your feeling um, during the uh, leadership contest? How did you feel that the um, candidates standing for leader performed during uh, the contest? And how do you think that they're working under... Uh, the new leadership now? I have to say, I felt quite detached from the Labour Party since losing. Um, perhaps a sense of disillusionment, um, perhaps my own kind of uh, uh, feelings still uh, being a bit bruised. Um, so I was hesitant to engage in a huge amount in terms of the uh, leadership uh, elections. And then as it turned out, I ended up um, being part of Jess Phillips' campaign to begin with um, until she withdrew. Um, and the reason that I, um, the reason I supported Jess was because I felt that, um, you know, being in opposition for five years um, against Boris Johnson would require somebody who could get cut through. Um, and I thought that she had um, the potential to be able to do that. Um, I did watch some of the, I didn't watch all of them, I'm sorry. Um, I did watch some of the debates. Um, I think I find it quite difficult to watch people that I worked very closely with in a competition with one another. Um, I, the social media stuff, I thought that they did really well on the social media, the films. Um, and I thought that that gave a really good portrayal of, um, of the Labour Party um, and they've done uh, a really, really good job and I thought everybody in the Labour Party should be proud um, of all of them who were standing to be leader for the work that they put in there. Um, I'm not sure, it felt like it was still very much, um, and, it, and it is, it's, it was a conversation with the Labour Party, um, 
my concern is that it's not the Labour Party and the membership that we need to win over. It's, uh, it's the general public. So the issues that were being discussed um, were very uh, kind of pertinent and of interest to the Labour Party and Labour Party members. Um, so I suppose that's a difference, isn't it, when you're, you're running a, a selection, um, but it's on full view to, to the general public, as, as is expected these days, um, that, you know, perhaps some of the broader issues that the Labour Party will have to face in the, the coming years probably weren't discussed in as much detail because uh, we got a bit bogged down in the things that we like to talk about. Now, um, you mentioned Brexit as one issue that led la- um, voters away from Labour in 2019. Um, what do you think Labour's position should be on an extension to the Brexit process? I know your predecessor, um, Austin Mitchell, is quite a Eurosceptic MP and he's been against that. What would your view on that be in terms of sort of, do you think, do you think they should sort of more, move more towards sort of saying, you know, let's just get out or, you know, stick with the sort of more Remainy voters that you've got um, sort of won over in 2019? I mean, I, I think that wherever people were in the country, that, um, you know, for, for those people who voted Labour, uh, of course, we know that the majority are Remain supporters. But across the rest of the country, they chose to vote Conservative. <laughs> they chose to vote Conservative on a message of get Brexit done. And, um, and it will be deeply uncomfortable for the Labour Party deeply uncomfortable um, to allow it to go through without any more um, kind of convoluted processes to try and delay it. And there, there is also a very good argument to say, well, in a post-COVID world, maybe leaving at this time is not the best thing to do. However, I think that it will be a long-running saw in constituencies like Grimsby, if the Labour Party are yet again seen to be the ones who are, um, you know, putting in place uh, convoluted plans to try and um, avoid leaving the EU. Um, There is a job of opposition to do. Of course, there is a job of opposition to do um, in making sure that it's done and done um, as well as possible and that the government are held to account with it. But I really think that this is something that is it is done now. Um, and it's not, a, it's not an easy thing for me to say. It's not a comfortable thing for me to say. It's not something that I wish had happened, but it has. Um, and to, to keep trying to delay it, I think will cement the views in people's minds that the Labour Party is just not prepared to listen on this issue. Um, you mentioned uh, COVID-19 there. How well do you think the government have dealt with the pandemic? At the beginning, it's funny you should say this, I had a conversation with one of uh, a local Labour Party member early this afternoon, and at the beginning I I thought, they're doing okay. Um, It's an unprecedented situation. Um, You know, I'm not sure what anybody else could have done, whoever was in power. Um, Increasingly, particularly since Boris Johnson um, was taken into hospital, that period of time where he has been, uh, where he was off the scene and then has been back in number 10, but doesn't really seem to have taken the, the leadership role in the same way, for example, that Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland has fronted up every single press conference. Um, he hasn't done that. Um, and, you know, if you're being charitable, you might say he's giving everybody a, um, a fair crack of the whip or leaving them with a, a dreaded uh, hot potato that they don't want to really be uh, left holding for too long. Um, so on a bad news day, farm it out to somebody else. But um, in terms of demonstrating leadership and taking responsibility for the decisions and the fact that over the weekend or late last week, the Prime Minister said, I'm, I'm going to be back and I'm going to take charge of all of this kind of makes you think well while we've all been locked down for the last 10 weeks maybe 11 weeks now um why haven't you been 
in control? Why haven't you been in charge? Why haven't you been um, overseeing all of the decisions? And um, we're seeing ministers come unstuck on TV, you know, denying some of the decisions that were made in the very early days. And um, I just think, you know, it, it is unprecedented. Um, and I think the general public will forgive um, a certain number of missteps, um, but they will not forgive uh, ministers trying to cover up, because that's what it looks like, uh, mistakes, um, and trying to rewrite history. And I'm not sure that they will forgive a prime minister that seems to have disappeared um, part way through this, despite the fact that, um, you know, he's had some pretty big life events that have taken place in this period of time. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, every day. And, and I think part of it mirrors people's frustration with being stuck in. Um, you know, even, you know, the fact that we're allowed out, but we're not really supposed to be out and we're not supposed to be within two meters of other people. And we can have barbecues, but we can only have them with uh, six people. And that has to include only one other household. And does it include children? And schools can go back, but now they actually can't go back. Um, but you all have to go back to work, even if you've got childcare issues. Um, and, you know, forget about shielding, forget about isolation. If you've got, uh, you know, if you were asthmatic at one stage, you should be shielding and then actually you don't need to worry about it too much. You know, we can relax that. Um, so it has, it has ended up being quite confusing. And I think that, that the exit plan of that hard lockdown really hadn't been considered um, very well. And I've been quite involved in, some of the um, advice to business and um, some of the quarantine impact. Um, and again, that just hasn't been um, communicated very well at all. And it all looks very confused and very messy. Um, I, and I think, you know, depending on what happens with um, the rate of infection, whether that starts to increase again, that. Uh, you know, that, that is something that, uh, that Boris Johnson and the government will be held accountable for if it starts to go up and we end up in a hard lockdown again. Um, we mentioned advice to business and there's been sort of unprecedented economic measures brought in to deal with the impact of this crisis. What do you think of the way these have been implemented? As, I mean, they, they seem very unlike what you'd ex definitely expect from a Conservative government in usual times. Mm. But um, do you think they were the right thing to do? Yeah, I think, what is it, 8.7 8 million people on the public payroll? We've never had such an extensive state-supported system of employment. Um, in all honesty, I don't think there's anything else that the government could have done. Um, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, I think that protecting, in the same way in the, um, in the last economic crash in 2008, steps were taken to protect people's mortgages. Um, so that they weren't losing their homes. I think, you know, that's exactly right with people's jobs um, and people's livelihoods and keeping them as secure as possible, particularly in sectors like hospitality, um, which have been absolutely uh, crippled by the lockdown and presumably don't know what the future holds for them. Um, I think that there are... There are Issues around the next steps. Obviously, we know that that um, that the system of uh, furloughing is coming to an end, mm -hmm. and um, know that the system of furlough is coming to an end um, to to new entrants. So anybody who's not furloughed before the thirtieth of June won't be able to participate. And I think that's where we'll start to see the impact um, of of COVID on uh, on employment, and we'll start to see presumably quite um, a hefty rise in unemployment. Um, but that, that measure combined with um, belated support for self-employed people, combined with um, mortgage support, um, have all been incredibly helpful. I think that there hasn't been enough support for people who are in rented accommodation. Um, and that uh, has probably caused a huge amount of stress and anxiety for a lot of people out there. Um, we've talked about the uh, the government's uh, response to the coronavirus. How do you think uh, the Labour Party have dealt with it? How do you think their response uh, to the crisis and the way that gov the government have been handling it uh, ha has been? Do you think it's been done well? 
it's a delicate balance. You know, this is a national pandemic. Um, you can't rush in to, um, to bash the government on everything. It's right to try and pick your battles in these things. You can't just start criticising everything because it will backfire. You know, you'll be seen um, as being incredibly petty if uh, you, you're not prepared to demonstrate some kind of constructive response. Um, so I think on balance, yes, it's been, it has been right. Um, I have enjoyed, as now as a lay person, I've enjoyed um, seeing some of the more personal accounts. So people who are working in the health system, people who are working in the care system, um, who are um, also elected members, um, and giving their experience um, of being in that uh, frontline COVID environment. I think it has given um, a really kind of unique insight and it's given them the opportunity to have a unique voice that perhaps um, the Labour Party in and of itself couldn't have um, because it wouldn't have that authenticity that, uh, that those others have had. So, and I think that that has been useful. I think that that has had um, cut through um, and I think it's probably helped in terms of um, uh, the Labour Party's um, ability to respond and critique with some substance behind it. You mentioned earlier that um, one of your roles is, um, is um, with Renewable UK. Um, now, My own today, <laughs> today, today we've just seen... Um, this goes 60 days without um, burning coal. So do, yeah. do you think that um, sort of coronavirus has sort of led to a shift in sort of more use of renewable energy? Um, I don't think that that is the principal reason that, uh, that we haven't been using coal. Um, I think the principal reason that we haven't been using coal is that we haven't been using as much energy generally. So industry hasn't been using energy. Transport hasn't been using energy logistics hasn't been using energy um, and so general demand has reduced quite significantly over the last few weeks. I think that what coronavirus has done and the pandemic has done is um, made people um, view where they live in uh, a different way without that immediate um, impact of uh, traffic, uh, without the immediate impact of um, air pollution and noise pollution um, that might be coming from airports if they live near airports. Um, and I hope that people have thought, actually, it's quite nice. Yes, now is the time when we've just had, um, you know, complete shutdown overnight. It's not impossible, therefore, to do these things. Um, it's just about will and it's about having um, a plan to make it work um, but we will see an increase in um, in policy coming from local government as well as from national governments um, to improve the areas where we live and try to reduce and keep reducing that use of, um, of fossil fuels so looking at more um, cycle usage looking at more um, electricity based infrastructure um, and at a, at a government level of course investing in renewables which is kind of my job to keep asking for. Do you think um, Brexit will help or hinder the renewable uh, industry? During the referendum campaign, I would have said it would hinder it. Um, and I saw a comment today, actually, uh, I think Made UK have said something along the lines of, we, we don't have enough um, uh, qualified people or people with the relevant skills and talents um, to be able to sustain um, a renewables, uh, a kind of full renewable sector um, with lots of the kind of uh, specialists based in, uh, in European countries. Um, and during the referendum, I saw some, not very many, but some uh, companies talking about the challenges that leaving the EU would bring. Um, mainly in terms of the, the changes to people getting in and out of the country. Um, you know, how easy would it be to bring people here to work if they have got specialist skills? Um, the reality is, I think, in the renewable sector, 
for some jobs, there are a handful of people in the whole world who can do some of these jobs. Should be, should we be training people to do that? Yes, of course. Yeah, we should. Um, it ends up coming down to companies deciding who they're going to train in their companies to do it and whether there is a necessity to do that. Um, and that's a, an argument that will continue to happen within the sector. Um, but, you know, as with all international companies and most of the um, big developers are international companies, they're not just UK companies, they are installing around the world, um, usually offshore um, wind turbines in particular. And um, so they deal with different situations in all countries. So it shouldn't be too difficult to, um, to continue to operate um, if we are in the EU or we are out of the EU. Um, there will always be things where uh, some of it comes down to government policy, to be honest, you know, how much support is government going to give compared to how much support other governments are going to give to the sector um, and making sure that government's got a very clear pathway of how it's going to roll out renewables, um, not just now, but in 10, 15, 20 years time to reach its targets because it did set some very bold targets through the course of the general election. Um, <laughs> and is it going to put its money where its mouth is? Um, it's, uh, you know, there, there's a, an awful lot um, beyond wind turbines that the government could be looking to invest in now um, and looking at branching out um, in terms of delivery of skills uh, to new entrants to the sector. So there's a lot of talk at the moment about a green economic recovery. Um, and that's where I hope some of the drive will come from within government to really start to look at what's happened um, you know, in those areas where uh, renewables is very strong, um, where it started to build a strong supply chain and um, supporting those small and medium businesses um, and looking at how it can replicate that and enhance it with new technologies, whether it's, I don't know, floating offshore wind or whether it's um, electric vehicle production or, um, uh, or looking at green hydrogen. Um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot more that it could be uh, involved in and try and get people excited about. Now, returning to um, Great Grimsby, um, so one of the statistics in the general election with that seat was it was one of the lowest turnouts. Um, why do you think people have become disengaged with politics and how do you think um, Labour and just pol people in politics more generally can engage people again? Yeah, I, I worked incredibly hard <laughs> over five years to try and engage people more. Um, I can't help but think that, you know, at the end of a very turbulent period in British politics, people have just had enough and they decided to stay at home. Uh, and I wonder whether a lot of Labour voters decided, well, I'm not, I'm not prepared to go and vote Conservative, but I will sit at home today um, and I will not cast my vote today. Um, so it, it's, it's a difficult challenge. You know, I, I, we, we did so much engagement. You know, I feel like we did, the local Labour Party here, we were textbook in terms of our um, attitude to engagement. We were out regularly. Um, you know, we were always talking uh, to local communities. We were holding street stalls. We, I held surgeries. Um, we did other events along community organising lines. Um, we did everything that we could to reach out beyond um, areas where we would traditionally expect people to um, come out and vote for us. Um, and at the end of the day, it still didn't work. <laughs> so there is something, I think, to be said then in, uh, in terms of, you know, national politics. I think people felt, I, people told me all the time, they, were, they felt really tired of the bickering. Um, so maybe it's a time to kind of return to a bit more mature um, approach to politics and, um, you know, avoid some of the um, silly arguments that were um, getting on people's nerves, seeing it on TV all the time. Um, probably not helped by, uh, you know, the way that people consume their news now and how it, it gets distilled. Um, everything seems very polarised um, and binary uh, rather than the grey area that, that things usually are operating in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I did a huge amount of work with young people as well. You know, I was always <laughs> going to the colleges and trying to encourage those people to vote. Um, 
more of the same, more of the same, but um, obviously we need to try and find something else. I mean, our, our local party membership increased uh, from about 200 to about 500. We're still one of the smallest Labour parties um, and a small constituency at that. Um, but even with that kind of almost doubling of the numbers, um, we didn't get hundreds of people coming out, knocking on doors, um, joining us on, you know, the usual rainy Saturdays in between election time either. So it's uh, it's a pretty hard slog. Uh, we're coming towards uh, the end of the podcast. It's been uh, great uh, speaking to you, uh, Melanie. We've had a, a fascinating conversation. And I have uh, one final uh, question for you. We've talked about the uh, lockdown quite a bit. And of course, because of it, we've all not been able to um, do things that we uh, normally would be able to do. So when things hopefully soon get back to normal, what one thing that you haven't been able to do uh, are you most looking forward to doing? I have to say, I quite enjoyed the lockdown. I know that's not the the done thing to say. (laughs) But for the first time in uh, five years, I've actually had a chance to spend time in my home, um, see much more of my family than I've seen. Um, but when lockdown lifts, um, I will be looking forward to going back to uh, the pub quiz around the corner um, with my friends, um, hopefully winning again. I've been doing a lot of quizzing while we've been on lockdown, so my general knowledge should have improved uh, no end. Uh, but yeah, seeing my friends is, uh, is probably going to be the, the biggest thing. Uh, well, I think that's something that uh, we all wish for and I hope you'll be able to get to the, the pub quiz soon. Uh, <laughs> thanks <laughs> once again for coming on the podcast. That's quite all right. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Don't forget that you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean or YouTube. You can follow us at Debated Podcast on Twitter, like us, Debated Podcast on Facebook. And if you want to email us, either about appearing or making a comment or reaction to the episode you've heard or any other episodes, then email us thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.